A um, bit of a disclaimer first, I'm not a greenie. I'm a pinky. I'm from Wyala, South Australia originally, so naturally we grew up in the iron ore district. Everything is pink, including the pigeons. Yep, we've got one hand there, fantastic. <laughs> two, actually, you can make it three, three, two, two, no, keep it at two. Okay. Um, so naturally, I'm not aligned to the green agenda traditionally. I'm an engineer and an entrepreneur by background, which kind of makes this presentation somewhat really exciting and at the same time quite painful for me. Why? Because for once in a lifetime now, I get to realise that engineers really aren't the saviours of the world. <laughs> there's, a, there's an idea, and what I'm about to sort of present as a concept isn't an idea that's necessarily new. It's four and a half billion years old. It's an idea that's been carried by nature, hence the presentation, schooled by Mother Nature, comparing our resume to humanity's resume and learning from Mother Nature in the way that what they're provided to provide solutions to some of the world's problems, not just directly those issues related to climate change and sustainability, but a variety of other problems we're facing as well. Even in a post-global financial crisis era, there's a lot we can learn about nature to embed uh, diversity and security and resilience in our economy so that we don't experience what we've just experienced in the economy, let alone all those other issues we're facing. So as I said, I'm a proud engineer by background. I'm a robotics engineer and a mathematical computer scientist. And in amongst my engineering colleagues, um, we, we try and learn from those giants. We try and sit on their shoulders and learn as much as we can. Leonardo da Vinci, classic example of an artist and an engineer. He's well known for his art. He's not very well known for all his engineering concepts right through to flight, to mechanics, to a variety of other concepts that from an engineering perspective he delivered. Henry Ford, one of the mainstays of industrial revolution and mass producing vehicles. Dilbert, <laughs> yay, fantastic, fantastic character and one of my favourites as an engineer as well. And obviously MacGyver, <laughs> who could defuse a thermonuclear weapon with a Swiss Army knife, a chocolate bar wrapper, and a mullet. <laughs> Take this example, the Shinkansen bullet train. Who's been on this train before? Some of you have. Amazing piece of technology. I'm a bit of rev head as well, so I love speed. And um, the people who designed this piece of technology were amazing. Okay? Now, the Shinkansen bullet train actually had a previous design to what you see here, a bit, bit more of a blunt nose design. And one of the issues they had was when the, the train would pass through a tunnel and then come out of the tunnel, the difference in pressure, so low pressure to high pressure, would create a, well actually more high pressure to low pressure, would create a low level sonic boom that would blow the windows out of houses, 500 metre radius, every time. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. <laughs> sort of sit there with a, you know, with a beer and a deck chair and just watch this thing happen every time. It's great. But that was a serious problem, right? A real serious problem and, and, and really, and that was actually very energy uh, consuming as well, this piece of technology. It's just so happened, the, uh, the head engineer was a, um, was a avid fly fisherman. So he would be sitting, you know, at the lakes and doing some fishing and one day he could see a kingfisher bird fly in the air and then just drop quickly, dive in the water with minimal splash, get its prey and then leave. And he thought, wow, we could learn from that. That's, that, that, that bird has just solved the problem I was facing. That bird showed me how to create, I'll go backwards here again if I can. No? There we go. They're not there. That bird showed me how to create the nose of this plane, of this, uh, of this train. So you can see the difference between the kingfisher's beak and, let me go backwards again, the nose. The engineer designed the nose of this train based on the kingfisher's beak. Reduced energy consumption by 35%, reduced noise by over 50%, and created a far more smarter solution by looking at what nature does. When I saw that, I was shocked. How could nature outdo us? How could it do, you know, we're engineers. We're, we're, we're the pinnacle of our species, of, our, of the food chain. How could, it, how could it outdo us? And that's where I started to embark on a bit of a journey. What could nature teach us about creating solutions, both technological, economical, and social? And we start to look at other examples of nature, whether it's about speed or efficient use of energy, the, the, the cheetah is extremely efficient at running, whether it's about fluid dynamics and movement in water, whether it's about flight and reducing wind resistance and drag and, and also vision as well, so take the owl for example. As a case in point, 
the, the, the Shinkansen bullet train also had an issue with wind resistance at the connectors where it was hooked up to electricity. So what they did was look at, okay, what in nature can solve that problem? They looked at the owl. They actually engra engraved owl-based, owl sort of inspired winglets on that little connector and it reduced noise and resistance by somewhat 30% or more. This little critter um, freezes during winter, virtually stops breathing and then thaws out, comes out of that during summer. What can we learn from that? Especially in a you know, cryogenically frozen inspired environment, for example. Hairstyles, what can we learn from hairstyles of tigers? And also flight. This, and these are just a handful of examples, but um, there are a variety of examples of in nature where you can learn from the way they do things and pick that up by way of solutions. Now compare that, look at the natural solution and compare back to what we've been doing. I don't know about you, but it just doesn't seem like we fit, we're fitting in. We're creating solutions or economies or environments that fit in with the way nature does things. We seem to forget that we are a species of nature. Or well, it depends on actually what's, you know, whether you're in the middle Midwest US or whether you're... <laughs> but we are. And we're not fitting in. And we need to find a way to fit in. So Leonardo da Vinci was inspired by nature. How do we learn from these kinds of approaches? Now, upon my journey as an engineer to try and derive solutions, we try and learn from uh, those of giants, those who have, who have trailblazed their way through and have created solutions to, to help us to learn from them. And, and Janine Benyus, a bo world's foremost biomimicry expert, is, is one of those giants. She coined the term biomim biomimicry, which is essentially learning about the way nature does things and creating solutions to solve certain problems that we are facing in humanity. She's a biologist by background and she sits at the feet of engineers, architects, um, business people, um, economists, and they all try and ask her, okay, well, why don't nature can solve my problem? And she sits at the feet of those, those players and helps them to solve solutions. And I was fortunate enough to, to sit at her feet for a few years, or in and out for a few years. And she told me, look, Nick, you're a young cub. You've got an old soul in your eyes. But you need to start working with nature, not against it. And one of the things that she, she brings in her book, uh, the book Biomimicry, is what she calls the laws of biomimicry. First law, nature runs on sunlight. Contrast that to what we currently run on primarily, fossil fuel derived sources like, like Tim mentioned, um, other sources which aren't necessarily solar based. Nature uses only the energy it needs. So it's super efficient design. Nature fits form to function. Contrast that to a car, for example. A car's function is to move you. Then why is it surrounded by a ton of metal around you if its sole purpose is to move you? Fitting form to function in nature is absolutely critical, and we're not following that in, in the economy at the moment. Nature recycles everything. And I've got some examples to bring that up later. Nature rewards cooperation. So yes, you have a thriving environment. Species are competitive, but they're also cooperative as well. That's why ecosystems survive. And that's why, if you contrast that to things like the global financial crisis and other economies, we tend, up, we tend to go fantastic and then grow really quickly and then crash, and go really quickly and crash. Nature doesn't do that in most cases, unless you're a pest. <laughs> Sounds familiar? <laughs> Nature banks on... And actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a humanitarian at, at heart. I'm actually against human species, obviously. But we need, to, we need to start to take stock of what we are doing and why we are not fitting in. Nature banks on diversity. So in other words, you don't have 3,000 of the same thing. It's diverse. There are different species, different ways of doing things, and diversity is a great thing. Maybe if we instilled diversity in banks, we wouldn't experience what we have. When one bank collapsed, several other big boys collapsed as well at the same time. Why? There was a lack of diversity in business model. Nature demands local expertise. Nature curbs excesses from within. In other words, we don't wait for there to be nothing left to... Um, you know, to uh, uh, be in trouble, we actually curb that. We recognise that and we start to evolve the way we do things based on nature curbing excess from within. And nature taps the power of limits. So taking these laws of biomimicry, okay, this is great, but how do we apply them? Other examples. This is a termite mound. Okay? Termite mounds keep their temp the temperature at the core of that termite mound at 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius day, or no day and night. Why? Because it needs to regulate the temperature to ensure the eggs are growing well and the kids are safe and think of all the resale value of the mound and all these, all these things, okay? So 
keeping it, keeping it temperature. It's not air-conditioned. It's natural. Why? Because it's got this in intricate form of tunnels that take the cold air or the hot air and put it down into the ground and cool it down and then the cold air, the cold air then rises as it heats up. So the hot air comes through the, the top, as you can see there, and then keeps it properly regulated. Designers, and actually Arab, I think, were a group that worked on this. Designers used this concept, mimicked nature, and created a building that doesn't require air conditioning in Zimbabwe. At a constant temperature, this building is maintained. Yeah, you know, it's not perfect. There are times where it you know, requires the air conditioning there, but most, most occasions it doesn't. Why? It's learned from how termines, termite mounds design these things. Take kelp beds. Um, kelp isn't exactly um, rooted in the ground three or four or five metres. It's only very lightly rooted into the ground. So when you've got all this water coming through, how do the kelp beds stay there? Why don't they just get pulled out with all the, the thousands of tonnes of water flowing through it every time? A guy named Jay Harmon, who's an Australian inventor, um, watched this process going on. I thought, that's amazing. How, how does kelp just you know, allow water to flow through it? How can we now use the kelp potentially to push water rather than allow the water to go through it? So what, what Jay Harmon actually did was look at developing pumping technology based on kelp beds. And this pumping technology is 75% more efficient. Why? Because rather than getting the water and pushing it out like normal, normal fans do, for example, or pumping technology does, it draws the water through and allows it to come through. So super efficient pumping technology. And given that, that the pumping pipes and pumps and that form of technology actually requires a lot of energy um, to run, obviously there's a climate-based solution there or an energy-based and emissions-based solution in the waiting there. Lotus leaves. Lotus leaves are self-cleaning. Why? Because you've got these little nano, nano bumps on there that um, in, uh, induce the water to roll up into a bit of a ball and the water then cleans the dirt off the lotus leaf. Lotusan, a company in Germany, has mimicked that and creating paint which self-forms um, um, after it's dry. You can add it to facades of buildings or skins of cars. It's now self-cleaning paint. Boxfish. You may think it not doesn't seem very, uh, very aerodynamic, but the boxfish has actually got a very low coefficient of drag, very close to that of the, the perfect form of um, the perfect aerodynamic form, which is a teardrop. So based on the boxfish, Mercedes have designed this car, which is extremely efficient. Yes, it's not very pretty. But, and it's green, which kind of makes, you know. But at the same time, it's extremely efficient. What else could we learn from nature in that, around transport? So I look at that and go, great, engineering design's fantastic. How could we use this as a model for economic development in South Australia? How do we go from this to something that's Jetsons inspired, that's cool, that's fun, that's exciting, and that we can actually use that people actually want to come to Adelaide and have a, you know, and, and be inspired by it, but at the same time that's synced in with the way nature, nature runs. And the way to do that, that we've seen as one case in point, as an example, and it's another concept that's been around for the last 15 years, but now we are using this, particularly here in South Australia and other places around Australia, is a term called industrial symbiosis, which is essentially looking at setting up precincts or border regions of businesses that can operate a bit like a food web, where you've got the exchange of materials, exchange of waste, the waste of one company is the input to another, uh, energy is shared through shared grid, Water is shared as well, heat is shared, services, intellectual property, resources are shared, so at the service level as well, to ultimately, ultimately create business environments which are extremely exciting, extremely innovative, but also resilient as well, and self-sufficient too. So this has already been done. Places like Denmark, Kalimburg, in the 90s they've done this. So it's funny because you've got all this waste heat and waste materials now that gets transferred to the residents for them to use. Their energy bills are way down. The savings they're making there are huge and a minute three seconds, so in counting. Um, the UK, National Industrial Symbiosis Program, I think over the last few years now, it's generated at least $200 million um, worth of savings, and I think the same amount in terms of sales. Why? You've got these different businesses that get together, they go, okay, well, what's your waste? Oh, I can use that as a resource, as an input. And they start to look at that waste exchange opportunity. It's a bit like that food web, as I mentioned, you know, the waste of one species is the input to another. And at the same time, you're creating diverse business concepts as well, or business models as well, where you've got different businesses that aren't the same as each other, but can start to share resources and opportunities to work together. Is this just the going green concept that we discussed? No, it's not. It's well beyond just going green and saving energy. Whereas the green development uh, objectives, you look at being eco-efficient, 
Industrial symbiosis is about being eco-effective, effective use of materials and natural environments. Green development objectives, I have to press the button here. Marketing and efficiency is the goal. With industrial symbiosis, source efficiency and innovation is the goal. I have to press the button three, four, or five times maybe. There we go, that way. Business as usual, just greener versus business transform new business models. In the typical sort of environment, business is independent and isolated. So you can do energy efficiency practices, you've got current businesses that kind of work independently of each other. But in an industrial symbiosis environment, business is integrated and cooperative. Does that mean we all have to hold hands and do business together? It doesn't necessarily mean that. What it does mean though is work together in a far more integrated and collective way. So it's not just about saving materials, energy and water as I, as I suggested. Um, it's about sharing services, intellectual property, ideas, knowledge, knowledge exchange to eventually create um, almost a, a, a brand for the state that adopts a far more innovative way of doing things. And we're starting to explore this concept at Tonsley Park. So the old Mitsubishi site, how do we embed these kinds of principles into that site is something that the government now is looking to explore. It's a pretty gutsy move. But we don't have an, if, if you ask my opinion, and it's just my opinion, but we actually don't have much of a competitive advantage in this state yet. I'm a South Australian tr through and through, but we can't rely on a mining industry to call it a competitive advantage, because it's not. Because everyone else has a mining industry. What's so competitive about it? We've got to create a source of competitive advantage in this state. And this new way of doing business, not just industrial symbiosis, but the stuff that Tim's talked about and a variety of others have talked about, these new ways of doing things, these ideas, this is what helps us create the competitive advantage in South Australia. Is this just a concept that we're looking to just explore here? Or, you know, is it, is it, is it global? Is it happening at a large, much larger rate outside of South Australia? The answer is yes, it is. Some of the work we're doing with the World Economic Forum is exploring what are these new business models? How does a Nike adopt a closed loop business model? Similar to that of the way we're exploring nature. How do we explore these kinds of models that are self-sufficient based business models? So Nike, as a case in point, has a plan never to take material out of the ground ever again. So rather than sell you the shoe, they'll sell you the service the shoe provides, thereby creating a self-sufficient closed loop business. So if I gene splice what the nature tells us and apply it to, to the economy, this is what I would argue is some of the laws of how we should be establishing a new economy. And all I've done is just replaced nature with the economy. Why? Because we should be operating in a very similar way. And this is basically the, my pathway, I think, for creating a new future for South Australia. Thank you.